Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, good middle of the night, wherever you may be. I hope you're comfortable watching this. Uh, it's good to be here with you all. Maybe you've got a bowl of popcorn, maybe a glass of wine by your side. I assure you that I am fully dressed, head to toe, so be sure of that. Uh, I'm Jack Gary. I'm the Director of Archaeology for Colonial Williamsburg. And for those of you who have seen my presentations on John Custis before, you know I like to open with a good quote. And this time I'm not reaching so far back into the past, but I've run across a note made by the former Director of Archaeology, Ivor Noel Hume. And it's from when he found the object you see in the center of the screen here uh, during the 1964 excavations of Custis Square. It's the base of a redware flower urn painted in a vibrant red. And here's what Noel Hume noted when he found this. He says, in the course of the work, the base of a large earthenware garden urn was found. It had been painted first with gray paint and then with red of a somewhat bilious tone. It seems that Mr. Custis was anxious that his garden should remain colorful even when his plants were not in bloom. The result must, I feel, have been intestinally unsettling. <laughs> so it's a bit of an overreaction perhaps to a painted flower pot, but what is the color that Noel Hume thought was so stomach churning? So that question, what is the paint color? What are we looking at with this vibrant red? Uh, that was our question. It made us realize that we had other ceramic objects in the archeological collection that had been painted post-manufacture. So by that, I mean that these didn't come out of the factory painted this way. The purchaser painted them for whatever end uh, that they were looking for. So could the analysis of the paint uh, help us better understand these objects, interpret these objects, understand their use, and help us to interpret the sites and the people from where they were found? So we chose four objects for Kirsten to analyze. And we've already met the Custis flower urn base, which was found near a series of large posts that formed a structure whose function is still unknown, but may have been a large garden arbor or trellis. Originally, the urn would have been globular in nature, similar to the one seen in Ferber's 12 Months of Flowers print. So we see that here on our screen. Uh, we just have the base of it, but the top of it would have been a kind of bowl-shaped, again, similar to what we see with Ferber's prints there. Now, the second artifact that we wanted to conduct paint analysis on was also from Custis Square, and it's a yellow, white, and black painted medallion. It's also from a redware flower urn, but it depicts the British Royal Coat of Arms. And so you can see here, and it's kind of hard, um, it's, a, it's a fragment of the whole piece, and we've got the unicorn. You can see part of the unicorn. You can even see part of the crown and the chain. Uh, you can even see on the crest here the, uh, the harp over here, and you can even see the little rampant lion uh, over here. Uh, but it's been painted uh, to mimic the British Royal Coat of Arms. These two objects, our first two objects, the urn base and the coat of arms here, uh, are from flower urns. And so finding these objects at Custis Square, which is the site of one of the most ornate gardens in America in the early 18th century, is fitting. But was there more to them than just holding flowers? So moving on to our third object, our third and fourth object, our third object, which we see on the left-hand side of our screen here, is from the ravine behind the print shop. And it's also from a decorative redware flower urn. It was chosen for analysis because its color, while not as vibrant, was pretty reminiscent of what we saw on the Custis urn base, which we thought could be good as a comparative piece. And you can kind of see this, this red coloring in here. Um, it's, it's not quite as vibrant, and it's almost kind of a, a, a neon fluorescent orange on there. Uh, and the final object is a Chinese stoneware ginger jar found at the site of the governor's palace when it was excavated in the 1920s. This vessel has top layers of a similar red paint overlying several generations of other colors. So little is known about this object, this stoneware ginger jar here. Um, we can tell underneath those layers of paint, the original underglaze decoration is there of uh, some kind of abstract Chinese designs. Um, but then at a later date, someone painted over all of that with multiple layers of paint. So, what does looking at all of these different objects and the paint that's on them, what can it tell us about our different sites? And Kirsten will help us to understand that. Hi, I'm Kirsten Moffitt, Conservator and Materials Analyst. And in the Analytical Laboratory, we have the tools to learn more about our collection through scientific analysis. And I work with a lot of painted surfaces, furniture, easel paintings, even house paints that survive on our historic buildings. 
But it's very rare that we have paints that survive from an archaeological context, so this was a really exciting opportunity. Now, when Jack brought this flower pot to my attention, we could see that there were these thin areas of this orange-red paint on its surface. But to be sure that it was paint, I decided to start my analysis with something called XRF. XRF stands for X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and it uses X-rays to determine the elements that are present in a sample. So here I am analyzing one of our 19th century German toys with XRF. So when I analyzed the areas of orange-red color on the flower pot fragment, I saw that the element lead was predominant. But this can mean a lot of things. There are actually a lot of paint ingredients, particularly in historic paints, that could contain lead. So I needed to take a sample to get more information. So using the tip of a needle, I collected a few pigment grains and examined them with something called a polarizing light microscope. And this allows me to see the individual pigment particles. Characteristics like their color, size, and shape can help me identify which pigment they are. So here is the sample that I took in two different types of light. In the center image is the sample in something called plain polarized light. And on the far right is the same sample in something called cross polarized light. So this is the image that it's really beautiful. It kind of looks like deep space. Um, so you can see that the sample contains these orange red pigment grains. But in cross polarized light, we see this deep yellow uh, orange color, but with these occasional specks of bright green light. And there's only one pigment that exhibits these bright green little starry lights. And that's a pigment called red lead or lead oxide. So this also explains the presence of lead that was detected by XRF. Red lead has been in use since antiquity, so this doesn't exactly provide a date for the paint but it would have been a moderately expensive pigment that creates a bright orange-red color that would have immediately attracted the eye to this object. I've also found this color on the interior of corner cupboards and buffets where its intense hue would have offset the objects displayed inside. So someone definitely wanted to call attention to this flower pot and red lead absolutely would have accomplished that. Now the urn base that Jack presented earlier has this stunning coat of red paint still on its surface. And in areas where that paint was flaking, we could see a gray or bluish gray color underneath. So since there were multiple layers, I used a technique called cross-section microscopy, where I collect a small paint chip from the surface and I cast it in a cube of clear resin. And that's what I'm holding in this image here. The white arrow actually points to the tiny paint chip that's fixed inside this cube. So when the resin hardens, I can cut the cube in half, essentially right through the center of the paint chip. So it's just like slicing right through the middle of a birthday cake, a very, very tiny birthday cake. And the resulting cross-section is examined with the microscope. So the final image is at the bottom right. So cross-section microscopy found that the urn was painted only twice, and the first layer is this pale, bluish gray paint, and the second layer is the current red. So I could see that the pale blue layer had to have been a presentation surface that was exposed for a certain period of time because there were cracks in its surface, and it must have been lifting or peeling when the red paint was applied because the red paint actually flows into the cracks and underneath some areas of this bluish gray. But I still needed to learn more about these paints. So I put the sample into our scanning electron microscope, or SEM, to obtain something called an elemental map, which assigns colors to certain elements in the cross-section. The SEM map found that while both paint layers contained lead, which is mapped here in the color yellow, the red paint contains mercury and sulfur, which is mapped in red and blue respectively. Now, mercury and sulfur in a red pigment indicates the presence of vermilion, which is a mercuric sulfide. Vermilion created a highly prized scarlet color compared with other reds that were available on the market in the 18th century like red lead or red ochre. And it was relatively much more expensive than those two pigments. So I was actually very surprised to find it here applied in a solid color on an object like this urn that would have been used outdoors. I did some more analysis and discovered that the red pigment was actually a mixture of vermilion with some red lead. 
And sources report that vermilion, because of its expense, was often adulterated with red lead at the paint shop. Apparently, this was very common with English vermilion, but uh, not with vermilion that was exported from um, the Netherlands or China. So this suggests then that the urn was actually painted with English vermilion. Custis probably never realized that he purchased adulterated pigment, but despite that, the color has held up extremely well. So he got his money's worth. Unlike the flower pot and the urn, this jar had clearly been painted numerous times. So on the fragments itself, we could see multiple layers of blue, green, pinks, and reds. So to really understand the layers here, I again used cross-section microscopy. And when I examined the sample under the microscope, seven very distinct paint layers were identified. And the earliest is the one on the bottom. It's this deep blue layer, which I have labeled here as generation one. But could I date this paint? Um, and in this case, I, I actually could. So let's look at these pigments. Um, so I found that the paint was actually composed of blue and yellow pigments. And what was very important about these yellow pigment particles um, was that they were rod-shaped. And I have um, annotated that with some of the white arrows here, and I think that you'll be able to see it on your screen when you're watching this at home. So there's only one yellow pigment that has these distinct bright yellow rod-shaped particles, and that's a pigment called chrome yellow, which was introduced in the early 19th century. So we know then that this very first paint cannot be any earlier than around 1815 when chrome yellow began to be commercially introduced. So the ceramic could be earlier, but all I can say to Jack is that the paints cannot. And then finally, the coat of arms on this flower pot. So when we started this project, to be honest, I, I wasn't even sure that this was paint at all. I thought possibly this coating might be some kind of deposit from the burial environment. And I collected a small crumb of the whitish layer and analyzed it with a technique called FTIR. FTIR stands for Foyer Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, which is why we call it FTIR for short. And this instrument uses infrared or IR energy to analyze the components of a sample. And it runs the resulting spectrum, which you see here, through our expansive database to find the closest match. And in this case, it matched from a white paint from the William Lightfoot house that I had analyzed back in 2014. So this doesn't actually mean that the same white paint used at Lightfoot was used on the flower pot fragment, but it does indicate that this coating is an aged white oil paint, just like that used at Lightfoot. So this example might not be quite as colorful as the others, but it shows us that even the most deteriorated surfaces have um, evidence that can yield findings that help us understand these objects and the life they may have lived. So what does this analysis tell us about our archaeological sites? Well, in the case of the palace ginger jar, it made us completely rethink our association with that site. The dating evidence is fantastic, and we as archaeologists love things that give us dates. So we know from Kirsten's analysis that it could not have been associated with the governor's palace, which was demolished at least three decades prior to the introduction of its very first layer of paint. Matter of fact, it was probably painted even later than that. So we now know that this object had nothing to do with the residents of the governor's palace. However, the site was occupied by several residents in the early 19th century. As a matter of fact, the advanced buildings of the palace stood into the early 19th century and were used as cottages. And then, Later in the 19th century, the Maddie School, which we see on our screen here, was built, which was an elementary school, which was established near the end of the 19th century. So what does this object mean then? Or who was using this object? Is it a DIY project associated with these people, a craft for an art class in the elementary school, perhaps? Well, we'll never get to the exact reasoning, but we now know that it couldn't be associated with the governor. Governor Dunmore wasn't painting this pot, we know that much. But the people who did paint this left us one final personal mark of their work. On the inside rim of the vessel, we can see green fingerprints from where the individual held the object while applying the first or maybe probably second coat of paint. We can all relate to that. We've all painted pots with kids. We know how messy it can be, and you've got to grab it in all sorts of different ways. So it's fun to see these personal little marks. So you can see kind of the whorls of someone's fingerprints there, particularly uh, the one on the right-hand side of the screen. Now, our three garden-related objects show that, indeed, as Hume pointed out, color in a garden was not relegated to just the flowers, 
or the use of natural materials and color palettes, but that paint played a role in setting the scene. When looking at 18th century English and European gardens and the ornaments available to be placed in them, there is considerable evidence that not everything was stately white marble, and that even statues could be painted to imitate real life. We see that here in this statue of a shepherdess from uh, uh, Antony House in Cornwall. And the medallion was obviously painted and with multiple colors, probably to imitate the actual royal seal. So it was creating the illusion of reality. And speaking of imitation, I think that is exactly what is going on with the Custis urn base. The first coat of bluish gray paint, which Kirsten has determined was a presentation surface, exposed for a length of time, as opposed to say a primer on which the vermilion paint was placed, it may be a color used to imitate lead, stone, or even weathered copper, all materials that were used for garden urns. Now the subsequent bright red vermilion color may also be another attempt at imitation. This time the effect may have been an imitation of Chinese cinnabar lacquered objects. Vermilion, after all, is the synthetic version of the naturally occurring cinnabar, which was used to color the lacquer on boxes, vases, urns, jars, and other ornamental objects in Chinese art. With the increased popularity of quote-unquote oriental motifs and English interpretations of what that meant, in the 18th century, this color would have been recognized as very fashionable. And while the possible imitation of stone, lead, copper, or cinnabar seen on the Custis urn was done to mimic much more expensive materials than the underlying redware pot, imitation was an art form. And there was no place better to see this art in full flourish than an ornamental garden. Creating illusion and suspending reality was one purpose of gardens. Just look at the lengths designers went to create forced perspectives and even create fantastical scenes such as grottos. Imitation in this context is not seen as being cheap. Rather, it was expected as part of the scene. An observer of an object like the urn in the 18th century would have likely been able to recognize both what the intended effect was, as well as the cost of using a paint like vermilion to achieve that illusion. The first urn that Kirsten analyzed for us also may have achieved the same effect, but through the use of relatively more affordable red lead, relatively, it was still expensive, but it suggests that like all consumer objects, one had choices based on how much one was willing to spend. I'm showing a couple objects here that I've tracked down that are very similar to, I think, what is going on with the urn at Custis. This one uh, that we see at uh, Branham Park in Yorkshire, I believe, is actually painted with that bluish cast to give it the uh, illusion of lead. And then the one on the right-hand side of the screen, I'm going to have to employ the Friends Network here to help me figure out where this thing is from. Full transparency, I found this on the internet. It looks so similar in color and style to the Custis urn that I need to know more about it. But I think these are the two effects that were happening and that Custis was trying to achieve in his garden. So objects like the four presented here, in conjunction with the types of analysis our materials analysis laboratory is capable of conducting, literally adds the com color commentary into the everyday lives of Williamsburg's historic residents. Now, the story doesn't end here, though. The process of putting this presentation together has already sparked new ideas for conducting even more testing on these objects. The urn base, for example, is going right back to Kirsten's lab right after this presentation for a deeper dive into those blue-gray pigments to help us understand what that color is. And as we work through the many archaeological projects that we have ahead of us, we now have one more tool in our toolkit to help us uncover the truths of the past. So thank you for your attention. On behalf of Kirsten Moffat, thank you. And we'll see you later.